Hey, there you go. What's happening? Hey, thank you so much for jumping into the podcast. Um, man, this is this is great. Um, I, you ready to just get started? Cause I I don't want to fan out too much. Yeah, no, let's go. All right, hey, I got to do this. I don't know if you are familiar with my podcast, but we do this for all of our guests. It's called the Over the Top Intro. It's something we do for just for you sharing our time. We want to give you your flowers while we're here. So we got to do this with a little high energy. Is that okay with you? Come on. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a drummer, author, songwriter from South Carolina by way of Lansing, Michigan. Once a walk-on soccer star at the University of South Carolina, go Gamecocks! And then after a little, after his graduation, his life will forever be changed from a generous contribution of $35 in a sweaty baseball cap. He became the founding member of Hootie and the Blowfish, who had a hand in changing of how we listen to music forever to paraphrase his beloved Liverpool soccer team. Walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. And hopefully along that walk, he will hold our hand. Mr. Jim, sorry, sorry, fail. Welcome to the podcast. How about that intro for an intro? I will take that seven days a week. Man, I am so happy to um, that you're on this podcast. And I'm going to try to hit a lot of different things um, just for giving us a little, mainly because I love Hootie and the Blowfish. Uh, from that, I spent off. I got a chance to follow your solo work. I got a chance to see some of your stuff. And I'm just going to start with my first question because that it's just going to be me showing how much I love for you. But um, you guys were like a shining light in this weird, dark world of grunge music and everyone trying to be real and everything. During that time of Hootie and the Blowfish, when you turn on your radios, um, you got a chance to hear more uh, an upbeat message. Um, does that does that weigh on you, or is that something where you take pride in? Because you guys single handedly may have been the first dagger in what killed grunge. <laughs> I like to consider myself a lover, not a fighter. But, you know, if you're going to put a dagger in my hand, I'll I'll make my way through the radio airwaves to carve out a little space for Hootie and the Blowfish. We did absolutely uh, appear on the scene going against the grain. And we loved uh, grunge music. We had no beef with grunge. That was something we were digging and trying to feel that angsty young person, you know, ripped shirt vibe. That was something I was all about. But when it came to writing, we couldn't ever escape our authenticity, which was the sum of Dean and Mark and Darius and myself, all of our musical experiences and our, our sort of growing up experience, our college experience and what we were living on the road when we started writing and working together. So there was no like uh, uh, for Hootie and the Blowfish anyway, uh, attempts at we're going to write this style or we're going to lean into this or this is popular. We didn't give a crud about any of that. We, we wanted to do something that, yeah, it was sincere and maybe something that was accessible. We had some obvious influences, REM probably being a big one, Toad the Wet Sprocket, all of the country music that we listened to in our lives, prime country for me at the time, all that rock and roll from you know uh, the UK, all that Brit rock was in our blood, R&B was in our blood and in many ways. So we just, it was a, a soup, a, a hootie soup, if you will, yeah. in making music. Now, around that time, I mean, obviously, you had a hand in writing some of my favorites. Um, Hold My Hand, Let Her Cry, Only Want to Be With You, and quite honestly, um, maybe giving out too much, but those are my, like, karaoke staples. Um, <laughs> I get up there. I, I'm, and that, they are, because, and I, and I guess what leads into my question, the reason they are karaoke staples, because it resonates with the crowd so much of at a karaoke club. Um, that was a special time in your life. May I ask why? The, where those, that level of inspiration came from. It was such a special time. Why was it such a special time in your life? Well, let's be clear. Like the special time starts when we are writing those songs. So uh, Cracker Review comes out July 5th in uh, uh, 94. 
But, you know, we started writing together and sort of getting serious as a foursome uh, in the fall of 89. So we were honing our craft and the things that were influencing us and those songs, which, by the way, were crafted in, you know, 90, 91, 92, 93, those big hits. We had tested those playing the clubs and the parties and stuff. So we we kind of got that vibe. If, if you were in our audience in the early 90s and you were vibing to that and there was people, you know, toe tapping and and finger snapping to those songs, they stayed in our set list and that was that was the litmus test, right? So when we got to record our first album, our debut with Atlantic in '94, we knew "Let Her Cry" was going to be there because unequivocally, people love that song when we played it from the first time we did. "Only Want to Be with You," same thing. Uh, "Time," same thing. "Hold My Hand." We we had tested those songs, so we knew if we ever had a chance to make a record label, uh, a major label debut. It, the album was going to be front loaded with those. And that's exactly what you all see on Cracked Review. Those are the first four songs. They happen to be the first four singles. You know, we weren't going to play around. Sometimes you only get 30 seconds uh, in front of a radio program or, or a record uh, label executive, man. You got to throw them what you think is going to stick. And those are the things that we thought would stick. And yeah, it did stick because that launched, um, just a wave of you guys' career, let alone how, like I said in the intro, how we listen to music, actually, because we understood in the grunge era, yeah, it's okay to be brooding a little bit, but you guys made it okay for us to be happy again. And that, <laughs> it, it, it just how it worked out. And then we follow um, Hootie as they go through you guys' journey, and then the album In Perfect Circle came out. In a way, I like that because it kind of sort of kickstarted your solo career in a way. Well, we were, yeah, we, I mean, we, we, by the time 2019 came around, we as a band honestly didn't know who we were. We'd been dormant for a while. We'd all been making some solo music, Darius's country stuff. I had some more spiritual music that I was letting out there, and that was where my life was at the time. And so when we came to recording a new record, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what we were supposed to be. We were supposed to go back to the old, uh, uh, you know, the ripped T-shirts and cut off shorts and, and Doc Martin boots that we were wearing in the clubs. Or were we, uh, you know, going to be following in Darius' suit, wearing cowboy hats and, and that country vibe? We really we were dudes in our mid 50s whose you know biggest album was uh, a couple decades in the rear view. So we took the sum of the way we wrote as individuals, Mark and Dean included, and we also collaborated with some other uh, songwriters. We just wanted to put out an album that sort of represented who Hootie and the Bowfish were in 2019. So he ends up being feeling a little bit part, you know, modern country, because that was fair enough. Darius had been carrying Hootie and the Blowfish through his country music for uh, eight to 10 years by that point. And and some of the spiritual messaging or, uh, you know, from, from the other uh, people in the band. So, you know, I... We always we love writing individually for sure, and it gets harder and harder through the years to write together because we're changing, we're evolving, we're not the same guys that were riding around in a van in 1991 with no problems, and we just wrote about stuff that guys in their 20s write about. Hell, we're, we were completely different people. So the music, uh, can, can, does it evolve? Does it change? Or do you try and keep that same vibe that you once had because you want to please the audience? Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, how were you inspired to follow that musical path? And, you know, you described the contrast of where you were then in the early 90s versus 2019. But how did that jump into your path of just re you really following your faith and making music on that level? Well, I had got desperate around to end of 2004 in my personal life and the band saw this happening too i was struggling i'd been under the grips of uh drug abuse and alcohol abuse for a number of years and and nobody knew what to do with me and by the time i got help and and restarted my path to try and discover you know that's what an addict does if they get clean they rediscover what the path was downwards to get them there and they have some renewed thinking and better ideas and a spiritual awakening to get them through the rest of their lives. And when I got to that point of, uh, you know, being uh, uh, woken again, I really changed the way I wanted to write songs. I, I was realized that a lot of the stuff later in my 
Hootie songwriting career was kind of dark. It was like a little bit leaning towards lonely and sad and broken and failing. And uh, so when I came back, I, I wanted to just write about the victory. I wanted to write about celebration of life because I felt like I'd been given a huge second chance in mine. So I wanted to represent that. Okay. And that leads to my next question about the book, the book swimming with the blowfish. I love the book. Um, mainly because it's not preachy. It's just your story. It's it's like, this is the story. Yes, you did have your addictions to drugs and alcohol, and you're having your addictions when you're front-loading probably one of the most popular bands in the world. And you, without giving too much away out of the book, you tried your best to hide it. You, you, you tried. <laughs> but anyone who knew you, there was a couple of failed interventions. There were a couple of things, but, you know, it shows someone going down this dark path and then come out the other end clean. And it was a remarkable tale because it's not preaching. It's just your story. But you I'm, I'm sure you helped a lot of people just by telling your story. If you want to elaborate, because if I keep talking, I'm going to give away some more stuff out of the book. <laughs> the spoiler is he lives, <laughs> you know, and certainly I want you know, somebody who's recovered and is on a better path, I, I feel like it is slightly my duty to try and share that with others. And if I can't do it specifically and I don't want to sound preachy, I tell the story. Like you said, here's here's where I was. Here's what happened. And and when I got desperate, here's here's what else I did. And and that story, uh, it helps people. I needed to get in front of people at some point to have them tell me their stories. And that's how I got that's how I stayed clean. You know, I finally, I found some people who are willing to be uh, transparent with their difficult journeys and they can be gut wrenching. You know, some people don't even make it out, but they often involve handcuffs and jail time and losing spouses and losing children and losing automobiles and driver's licenses. And I got in front of these people that were telling me these terrible stories, but they had this redemption too. They'd been They've been lifted into somewhere much healthier and they had a lighthearted laugh at themselves that they'd even survived it. So that was so inspiring to me. And I kind of wanted to tell it in that way. All I can tell you is what I did. I can't tell you what to do or what to believe or, or what to think, but you might be inspired when you see one person's journey about it. So I wanted to do that. Definitely tell that journey. Same goes with the hoodie tales that I tell. It's like, who, you know, what can you do to have people, uh, get to know Hootie the Blowfish and their journey more personally, tell them what happened. Tell them what happens behind the scenes. Tell them what happens in a van driving around in Alabama in 1992. You know, all the little stories that people wouldn't imagine, I think, can just be told. Who needs to be preached at anyway? And you know what's interesting about the preaching as part of it? I listened to the audiobook. So... You know, while I'm driving, while I'm doing my nine to five, and I'm doing this because, you know, it what was it, 300 some odd pages? No, I yeah. have you read it to me. So I'm very curious when you were doing the audiobook, was it easily, was it easier to verbally go through it other than to write it down and have to live it? Because you're kind of living it again because the way you tell it in the audiobook, your inflection, yeah, it's you. You're telling your story again. But you're telling your story. So not only do you have to read those words, but you have to kind of sort of mentally live it again yeah. in order to reach the, you know, the listener. Uh, you know, the hard stories than the heartbreaking stories that I wrote are, are no less heartbreaking or more heartbreaking when you got to tell them. I mean, they were, they were difficult to write the parts about um, the passing of my mother in the book, which is, you know, very personal and was difficult because I was in a bad space at the time, too. You know, that wasn't easy to write and it wasn't easy to uh, say it into a microphone either. And uh, I suppose, um, you know, those don't change in that way. And so I'm thankful my wife, uh, you know, Laura is the one who said you need to be the one who. Uh, records your audiobook. Don't get some other voice actor to do it. You need to be the one because it's more personal. So I think that, you know, when you hear the author's personal voice, I think it does maybe speak a little more deeply. When you hear Bruce Springsteen reading his audiobook, man, you're you're like it's like you're sitting next to Bruce Springsteen or when anybody does it. We're listening to the Bono one right now. And 
uh, to hear Bono tell his stories. You just got to have your own voice. And I'm thankful that Laura sort of pushed me hard and said, nah, you got to do that. And it takes forever. And I wasn't even that good at it, but we pushed through it. And, and it, I think it's worth it in the end. A lot of people have commented that you need to have the author's voice on there. Now, that's pretty dope because I am going to the Springsteen one next. Um, the one I listened to before yours was Life by Keith Richards. Yeah. And boy, <laughs> woo! That is that is something because when you sit back and you listen to him tell these tales, like, are you are, are you serious right now? <laughs> um, but like that that's all you could that's all you can say. But I'm like, one of the things, uh, did you write music while writing the book? Uh I had been, you know, uh co-writing with my band since the late 80s and uh, we learned how to do that on our own. We weren't form formally trained, so that was the only way we knew how. And then by, you know, the uh, 2008, I'm starting to make my first solo album and learning the craft. Still, it takes a lot of t time to learn how to do it, uh, you know, well or you know, uh, so people can understand your emotions. And so I've been writing, but I think during I started writing this in the fall of 2017, and we ended up starting to write Imperfect Circle in 2018. So and I didn't tell my band I was writing a book because I wanted to wait until I was, you know, finished and I could say, I've written all this stuff. And just in case I never finished, I wanted to wait until I was done. And But we started working together. So I got a whole another feeling uh, between my bandmates and I while I was in the process of still writing this story, which was partly about the past. But since we reunited, I got to pull it into the future. So the story gets pulled into 2018 and 19 by virtue of our reuniting for the uh, group therapy tour that, that summer. And right. so that was pretty lucky timing as was the success of the tour. Cause then I get to have a nice ending to the story we reunited we didn't know if we ever would do a big tour and it was just like 1995 it was such a celebration to end a book and then the crazy other great part is that i had finished it i was the story was going to end in basically november of 2019 and it was a nice little bow on it and thank god i didn't try to drag it any further because we know what happened in three months later is covid and that would have yeah. been just a depressing and weird thing to bring into a book that's otherwise has a nice front middle and end now i'm very curious when you're um since you were kind of i guess you kind of missed the cutoff on both or is, is a very short window in between does the music influence the book or does the book influence the music um in your solo stuff well, what happened when the book came out finally, so I was writing music for the band and, and myself while writing the book, but it all come, we have the tour in 2019, the book is released uh, not until 2022. So I had some time to keep writing and, and, and I don't know if the book influences my music or not, um, but the music certainly gives me things to write about because in the book, because a lot of people try and understand musicians through their music. You know, that's what we do. We read lyrics of our favorite artists and we feel like we're connecting with them. So I hoped that people would connect at the references I was putting in the book that were about my solo writing and about my band writing. And, you know, in the end, it's it's the great thing is in 2022, I had to go out and support the book. I wanted to go out and do some, you know, uh, uh, bookstores and, and some uh, speaking events to support the book. And I realized, wait, I can also incorporate music into that, which became really cool. So I was, I've been going out for over a year doing events where I play some of the music and I talk about the book and tell stories and make people laugh and we sing along. It's kind of a pretty cool interactive way to perform. I'm curious. I, I have to ask this because, and I'm sure this has come up. What's harder, writing a book or writing a hit song? <laughs> Jeez, honestly, it's probably harder to write. It's harder to have a hit song. Mm. Let me clarify. A lot of hit songs have been written that never got anywhere near the radio waves. They were great songs that couldn't make their way up to, you know, influencing a radio programmer or a record label to record it. I bet there is a thousands of hit songs out there on the floor of somebody's apartment on a piece of paper and they never had 
access to getting in front of the people that would make them, you know, hit songs. Uh, so I think a lot of hits have been written. Hell, I think I've written a lot of hits and they never got off the <laughs> off the floor of my little studio where the piano is. But that's just me. Uh, writing a book is just a grind. You know, maybe it's the difference between uh, running a 5K and running a marathon. You know, I, I, I wrote 120,000 words and we uh, edited it down to about 80,000 words in the end for my book. And, you know, a song is three and a half minutes. It's, you know, yeah, maybe uh, two yeah. verses, a bridge, a chorus. Maybe you repeat the chorus a couple of times. But, yeah, it's the difference between a long endurance run and uh, a little 5K or a, a 10K run. Okay. Um, now, one of the things I, um, I, I want to ask, because you've been on your journey. You're clean and sober for over 17 years now. You did the work. You looked inside yourself. You help others. But when you get back, um, I go back to some of those stories in the book, and I'm not spoiling too much. I hope I'm not by saying this. You guys have a pre-show ritual. You guys will all get around and have a shot of Jim Bean before taking the stage. How do you adjust now? What do you do? I mean, like, what do you do? Uh, at first, I'm scared out of my mind uh, because I know I can't drink. I, you know, I become convinced after the interventions and after finally seeking help, it was pretty clear to me I can't drink like a normal damn person and I have to deal with that. And there's a program and there's a 12 step guide to getting through that and being happy in life. Uh, but at the beginning, when I'm standing there, you know, with a few days clean and sober or a few weeks and we're doing our ritual, it's like your body just re wants to do it. It's, it's so normal. So we're lifting up the shots and I go from, you know, pretty scared and like I don't want to relapse to kind of pissed off. I'm, I'm kind of deep down resentful and angry. Why can't I drink? They're all drinking and having fun and they look like they're having a better time than me. And that's just me grappling with you know, that spiritual thing. My spirituality is I'm either going to accept reality or or fight it. It's not so much even about God for me. It's about am I going to accept the reality that's in front of me? And I can have a when I can, when I can accept that everybody's there's 20 people doing shots and I ain't one of them. I'm, I'm being spiritual. If I can accept that, I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have serenity. And if I fight it and I can't accept it, I'm going to be mad. I'm, I'm going to be all resentful and that's not spiritual. I mean, I just want to be like anybody else, have a smile on their face. So it wasn't good. It took me uh months worth of uh, holding those shots up. I had to, you know, do Gatorade or Red Bull. And I just felt like such a wimp, you know, I was making it about manlyhood, right? That's what we do. We hold up those drinks and we think we're yeah. more manly. The more we drink, that's what I always told myself and until it wouldn't work anymore. And, you know, eventually I realized, you know, I, I can't drink. I accept that. I'm going to move on. And over time, it became clear that I'm I'm thankful that I got to uh, make a big change. It was the right thing for me. I'm glad that you figured out in a way it was all in your head. I mean, like, I don't think anybody else had those feelings about you being a wimp or whatever. I, I don't think they did. I think you were just kind of like, like you said, wrestling with yourself, you know? Yeah, my ego. My ego couldn't be satisfied. My pride was a little hurt that people might might think I'm smaller than I really am. And that wasn't true. And my, you know, like I said, partly my fear of, you know, I, I get all worried about what people are going to think of me. And that's ego. And that's just dumb. And I, it took me quite a, a few years to understand it and accept it. You know, we all developed here in America with our you know, all the conveniences and technologies of life, but damn, at the heart of it, we're all the same. We all struggle with, you know, acceptance and love and loneliness and all that stuff. We're human and we're never going to change that. And so I had to work through realizing I was uh, a human. <laughs> okay. Well, Sony, I got a few more questions and like the first part of this, this is for the listeners. This is for everyone else. Now, I do have a second set of questions because I am a fan, and, and it, it it may be selfish. I'm, I'm being up front, but I'm sure other people would want to know if they go down to Hootie Train like I did. So do you mind if I ask a few questions? You got it. You got the floor. 
All right, yes or no? Did Hootie and the Blowfish start off as a cover band? Absolutely, yes. Unashamed. That's how you can make enough money to afford to get into a real studio to make your original recording. So it it was sort of uh, doing one thing that was a lot of fun and a little bit of a sellout just to pay for the thing you really want to do. Okay. All right. Um, do you still have your first drum kit? Ooh, you know what? I got three pieces of my original drum kit. Okay. I want, and, uh, you know, I gave it to somebody, uh, cause I like to give away drum stuff so somebody can use it. And then a few, after we got big, I wanted to find it. I'm like, I called the dude, dude, can you, do you still have that drum set? And we made a funny trade and I got back the several pieces from the original kit and I made one into a cool lamp. It's, okay. you know, it's a floor, it's a, uh, like a Tom Tom, like a 12 inch. And then out the top of it is a post with a lampshade on it. So I'll, I always have one of my original drum pieces in the form of a lamp. That, that's dope. Now, I have read and you're vegan now. Attempting. I'll call myself officially plant-based. Okay. <laughs> okay. With that said, what is it about the St. Louis Slinger that brings you so much joy? <laughs> The gooey, melty, meaty, salty, nasty, wonderful flavor of, you know, melted cheese, a hamburger, uh, an egg, a bun, <laughs> uh, chili, all that going down your throat. Yeah, there's no uh, vegan food that will ever replace that for me. Just like, uh, you know, Italian sausage or bratwurst or a filet. And believe me, on occasion, I choose to put a, a bite of that in my mouth just to remember, ooh, ooh, that's good. You can't replace it. But the Slinger, I mean, only in St. Louis. I don't know who started that or why they kept it, but I'm glad they did. <laughs> now, this is something I'm sure you've been asked, but I, I, I just want it for myself. Are Hootie and or the Blowfish actual people? Hootie was a person. The Blowfish was a separate person. Neither of them were ever in the band, Hootie and the Blowfish. Darius Rucker used to name, nickname people in college, not always even nicely. It was always making a little fun. And one night, two guys walked in a party at the same time together. The Blowfish, which Darius named because this guy had uh, big jowls, and Hootie, who had these big eyes or big glasses, like a hoot owl, I guess, walked in and somebody said, hey, Hootie and the Blowfish are here. And at some point soon thereafter, Darius said, that'd be a cool name for our band, which they had just started at the time. And the rest is history. Right. I can't be blamed and I can't take credit either because I wasn't there. Okay. Well, as you see, I have, I know you're a soccer fan. I'm rocking my Ted Lasso stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> season three away jersey and quite honestly i had to make a choice i wanted to know like uh, i was going to go with the jamie tart um banter it, it, and it's weird that my favorite football team or soccer team is a fictional one <laughs> it just is i just love that show so much but i know you're you're diehard liverpool so when I was getting my questions together, I would be remiss. My son begged me because we're getting him in soccer. He played a year, uh, the year before last. And now he he, he really want to just prove himself. And he asked this question to anyone who's remotely interested in soccer. And I feel I'll be doing him a solid if I ask the question uh, why he's in school right now. Ronaldo or Messi? Do I have to? Do yeah. I really have to? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> if your well, mind changes tonight, no problem. Uh, no, I, th I don't think there's ever been a question for me. And if, if it's two guys and it's those two, then for me, it's always going to be messy. Um, and believe me, Ronaldo has some insane talent and insane focus and passion and abilities. I mean – it's, it's ridiculous that they even have to be compared. But as far as attitude goes, I just sometimes see Ronaldo with a, a face that is, 
looks like he's not grateful or he looks down his nose at people. And and I don't like that as an athlete. I've you know played sports and I get it. Some people are more competitive, but you know, if I got to be a teammate of somebody, I sure as hell want somebody who's not going to yell at me on my team. <laughs> I will say, I will say to Sony, that is the first thing I said to him. I'm a messy guy and just let's just take the game out of it. Let's just take the beautiful game out of it. Ronaldo has such a punchable face. And I don't, that's not his fault. It, it just, it's not his fault. He just does. If he were to smile using that same face more and not scream at his teammates, I don't think I would want to punch it as much. But you're right. I mean, that he brings sort of that on himself. And so, yeah, there's that. And being an athlete and being a role model, if, if you have to be, if they say our greatest athletes should be role models, then I I think it's safe to say that Messi might be the better role model. Well, and lastly, and certainly not leastly, this is the last question. Like I said, very selfish, self-indulgent questions, but I just kind of want to know because I follow you guys for so long. Sha- shaving your head was a part of your spiritual journey. Now, remember the golden locks from the cover or, well, the back cover of Crack Rearview Mirror? Um... The, how? How was it part of the spiritual journey? Well, I had been clean and sober for a couple years, and I signed up to make an album with this wonderful, super talented, crazy, sober British guy named Francis Dunnery. And I trusted him. He was and is super talented, works fast, has great, he's a prog rock hero in England, and and I just, he was an idol and a friend. And so we sat down to make our record. And I knew that Francis had had a big um, change in his life. You know, I knew he didn't drink and I knew he had short hair and more shaved basically. And I knew looking back at his old records, he had this long hair and I was curious about his journey. And he had told me, you know, what his story was, which was very similar to mine, you know, having to make that big change from, big egoic rock star with long hair to a spiritual, uh, spiritual change. And so that was fine. That was his life. I'm in my journey. I'm sober and feeling pretty happy, but my life is still kind of falling apart. And we got to the first day <laughs> of starting, you know, the overdubs for the album and we're uh, together. And he says, he says, Sonic, he called me Sonic instead of Sony. He said, we're going to do one thing before we start this project. And it's the thing you have to do before starting this. And he goes, we're going to shave that head of yours. And I was like, what? My eyes got big. And I thought, because I was still a little bit attached yeah. to you know, my hair, my vanity. And he said, and I trusted him. He said, I promise you will not regret this. He said, this is something he had gone through. And hair is part of our journey. It's part of how we see ourselves and we need to let go of our whole selves if we're going to be uh, fully renewed. And I said, you know what? I trust you, brother. And we drove 15 minutes down to this little podunk mountain town in North Carolina uh, uh, barbershop and gave the guy 12 bucks and said, shave it. And he said, the whole thing? <laughs> oh, I, and Francis was laughing. I said, yeah, I, I, I trust this. And, I, man, I, I've never felt better. I, I and at that moment, I knew what Francis was talking about. It's our whole selves, right? It's how we see ourselves inside and out. And I needed to start over. And, and that's what he wanted me to do is start over. And uh, thank you, Francis, for that. That's awesome. And there's no way to just – we got to end it right there. But before we do, I, I do have to ask. I, I think I do have one more question. There's an audio version to this podcast. If it's okay with you – I would love to play some of my favorites from your solo work, like the new one, Sitting in the Green Grass, A Little Revival. That's actually one of my favorites, and I see Heaven on Earth. Is that okay? You got my permission. And for the record, I own a Roy Kent jersey as well. So That's, that's what I'm team. talking about. That's the team I follow. I don't care if they're fictional or not. It's a great story. I've like probably shed as many tears watching that show as I did the last two seasons hey, watching Liverpool. Me, me too? <laughs> and, and, wow. Um, I Okay. Full disclosure, real teams, I'm more of an Arsenal guy, so I know a thing or two about tears. Yeah. And, uh, and in the back, I don't know if you can see it, there's uh, the Danny Rojas because 
football is life. Sí. And before we get up out of here, look at this camera, that camera, your camera, please. Anything that you got going on, all things Jim Sony Sony Phil, please go ahead. Just just plug away. Oh my goodness. You don't want to do that to me. You don't want to give me that time and that space, but Yes, I do. I'm going to say a big thank you to uh to you and to any of the people who have uh, streamed the new music and the Hootie music and have stayed fans through a lot of uh, a lot of decades. We do it because of the connection. We do it because we love seeing people having a good time through our music. And so keep doing that. We'll come back. We'll do another tour and uh, keep downloading the music. Catch me on Facebook too, Jim Sonnefeld Facebook. Catch me at Sony Time 64 on Instagram because I love connecting there too. Well, Sony, thank you so much. I'll make sure I post that in the um, w once we go on our social media. This has been awesome. This has been great. And when you do want to do new projects, you're always welcome here. Where the Roy, Roy Kent jersey next time? We'll match. We'll do that. <laughs> but, Roy. Sony, this has been awesome, and I thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Be blessed. You too. Bye.